بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله واصحابه وعلى من تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وبعد We have, inshallah, today, as you can see, food for thought, a very practical topic, as you've heard. Um, we'll be covering a wide variety of items. And uh, the important thing uh, is that you do understand each individual principle and rule. Uh, each of the rules under uh, would fall a number of items. You can actually look at them as being halal or haram based on those individual rules. So as you progress through the course, if you have any questions, please put them on the side. Ask and don't you know, feel ashamed or shy. If you want something repeated over and over again, don't uh, feel any, in any way embarrassed. It's best that you do ask uh, for clarification as opposed to sitting down and not getting that clarification. The thing that's the, actually the worst nightmare for anyone teaching is that someone walks away from that course, that class, that halaqa, that session, having misunderstood. I don't mind if a person forgets the entire thing. It's not a problem to do that. Go ahead, please forget everything. I mean, I don't mind in the least. But the worst thing is, if someone comes about having just taken half of what you've said, and then somehow mixes it with something else that they've heard elsewhere, and then they say, so-and-so said this, and it could be the oddest fatwa that you hear in the course of your own life, where did you come up with that from? And it, it would be spread. And I mean, it's not a matter of me just talking like this fictionally. It actually took place with a few of the sheikhs in our own community here in Vancouver, one of whom uh, spoke to me and mentioned exactly what took place with him, and it was a shocker, subhanAllah. What had happened was that uh, he was speaking about what would break the prayers. And you know, there's a hadith in which Rasulullah mentioned if one does not have sutra, if a, if a woman crosses in front of him, a donkey crosses in front of him, or a dog crosses in front of him, these are all nullify the prayer because one does not have that sutra, that barrier between him and uh, the direction of, uh, of the qibla. So some who were there in attendance, they said, the sheikh said, dogs and women are equal in status. So-and-so said this, so-and-so said that, and it, and it was just a big mess. He never said that to begin with. He was simply clarifying the meaning of a hadith. And those who were in attendance just took part, took the other part, one and one together, and they said, the sheikh said this. So please don't misunderstand, don't misconstrue. If you have a problem with any point, ask for it to be repeated over and over again, and inshallah we'll do that. And that's the important thing, that you do benefit from uh, what, uh, what is mentioned. So this is the big question over here. We we'll always see halal, halal, halal. But the matter is, why halal? What's the big deal with halal? Now I'm about to ask, I'm sure you'll all give very satisfactory answers. And we have within our community, mashallah, a number of people who to them, the greatest wajib in Islam is eating halal food. More than prayers, more than everything else. You actually will find some who wouldn't pray salah, who would not wear hijab, who would not do anything that they should in terms of Islam. But when it comes to halal food, yes, we have to eat halal. Why? Because it's wajib. MashaAllah. So it's become really to one point where people have become extreme and even fundamentalist, you can say, in terms of eating halal only. And in the same light, we have people within our community who, subhanAllah, have taken to the other extreme. They don't care, halal, haram, it's not a big deal. They become somewhat Christian when it comes to eating foods. Now, although in the Bible it states a person cannot eat pork, it's forbidden, by, as they say in the words of Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam, where he forbids one eating pork, they take the words of Paul that it does not matter what enters the body, but ra rather, you know, uh, it's more important about what's in the heart. So they've gone to an extreme where they don't care what you eat. And we have Muslims like that as well who don't care about what they consume. It's not a big deal. Halal, haram, don't make it a big issue. It's all the same. In the end, it's what's in our heart that counts. And we find that often with many of the, uh, you can say, secular or even the up and rising younger generation. May Allah guide us all to the straight path and keep us firm upon it, inshallah. So once again, why is it so important why is it so important to eat halal, to seek out halal, and to verify from where you eat? Um, we have the very first point, which is the very evident point. That is, that eating halal would ensure that your dua is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now look at this. In the hadith, 
Rasulullah mentions a story of a person traveling on a long distance. He raises his hands up to the sama, Ya Rabbu, Ya Rabb, Oh Allah, Oh Allah. He's begging of Allah Jalla wa Ala, Oh Allah, answer my dua. He was in need of something so dire. He's raising his hands up, you know, openly beseeching Allah Jalla wa Ala. But there's no answer. He does it over and over and over again with no answer. Why? The reason is given. It states, مَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامٌ وَهُذِّيَ بِالْحَرَامٌ فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ SubhanAllah Meaning, the person's food is haram. His beverage haram. His clothing haram. He was fed and nourished and raised with haram. So how can Allah Jalla wa Ala respond to his dua? That's definitely something we should have in our minds. Imagine if you are in a position where you are in dire need of Allah's mercy. Whatever it be, whether an exam, whether you're about to go into an accident, whether or not you are in an airplane with heavy turbulence. That's a scary thing, of course. The heavy turbulence, the entire plane shakes. So imagine now, you're in that position, and you say, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. And you don't see any response whatsoever. Why isn't there a response? It's because you were very lenient in what you consumed, what beverages you took, the clothing that you wore. You didn't care. Halal, haram, it's not a big deal. Because to some, as they say, it's the heart that counts. We know from this hadith, not only the heart, but beyond that as well. Your foods, your beverages, your clothing, the way that you're raised, all of that is very important and plays a very important pivotal role in the way that you should and the way that you would receive an answer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have here now an interesting story from a man named Hajjaj bin Yusuf al Thaqafi. Al Hajjaj, for those of you who like history or have read something about him, he was during the Umayyad Khilafah. He was one of the governors of the Iraq area. He ruled with an iron fist. No joke. Anyone who uprose against him with the slightest of words would be killed. I mean, to show you how extreme he was, a boy was brought forward who had memorized the Quran at a very young age. And imagine, six, seven year old kid had memorized the entire Quran with tajweed. Not a matter of just simply saying a word, a few words here and there, some with tajweed, some without tajweed. No, the entire Quran memorized it with tajweed and he was able to understand the words of the Quran. So a scholar in the making, subhanAllah. So when a hajjaj heard about this young boy, he said, bring him to me, I must see him for myself. He's a prodigy. I have to see him for myself. The boy was brought. He told the boy, recite of the Quran. And the boy had heard that this man was an oppressor. He transgressed the bounds and limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the boy only read of the Quran, the ayat of wa'i, punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to instill fear in the heart of al-Hajjaj in the use of al-Taqabi. So as the first ayah, the second, the third, the fourth, he said, boy, don't you memorize anything of al-wa'id? Al-wa'id meaning the ayat that speak of the reward of those who are in Jannah. So the boy said, yes. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَخْرُجُونَ مِنْ دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Then Hajjah said, don't you know the Quran? يَدْخُلُونَ You made a mistake. He said, no, I did, I did not make a mistake. Yad Khulun was during Rasulullah's time and the, and the Khulafa al Rashidun, when they were pious, people were entering into Islam in masses. But because of your oppression, O oh, Al Hajjaj, people are leading Islam in masses. The little kid, seven year old. Al Hajjaj looked at this kid, he said, This boy, if he grows up, he will indeed have a shatan, a course in life. He may even be a threat to me, kill him, Allah. And he was killed. Rahimahullah, rahmatan wa that's how rude this, this person was. So the Hajjaj in the Iraq area was appointed over all these small villages and towns, one of which was well known for its inhabitants. Everyone there, his dua was accepted or mustajabed. Now imagine, subhanAllah, anyone who was there, they were in fear of the dua of the people of that city. They would make dua, it would be answered immediately. So the Hajjaj thought to himself, I am now going to govern them if I'm to oppress them, they'll make dua and I'll be finished, I'll be history. 
So he thought to himself, there must be a way to rid them of this power or this ability to have the dua accepted. What is it? I'll feed them haram food. How? He can't just feed them haram food like that. So he organized a banquet. Big banquet. He called everyone in that town. Come, you know, this is your night out. Party. You have your food. You have your beverages. And then after they ate and had their fill, and he was sure every single one of them ate, he asked them, how did you find the food? They said, MashaAllah, it was beautiful, delicious. Jazakallah khayran. He said to them, did you all have your fill? Yes, we did. He said, now I have no fear of any of you. Why? Everything you eat right now is haram. So therefore, your dua is no longer accepted. So I can do whatever I want to you and oppress you in that sense, and I would not have fear of any repercussion. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So I mean, we have examples like this. And the important thing here, and we have to understand this, is that your dua would be accepted or rejected on account of this matter. Many of us tend to look and think, why, have, why is it our dua being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's true, at times Allah jalla wa ala would delay the response to your dua for something better. As you know, when you make dua to Allah, you get one of three things. Either Allah gives it to you directly, whatever you're asking for, or He, wait, he wards away an evil uh, that would have befallen you, but on account of your dua for good, Allah jalla wa ala protects you from that evil. Uh, or Allah jalla wa ala keep it for you in Jannah. But if you are consuming the haram, living your life in a haram way, you've got to really come back and critically think, what am I doing wrong? Is there something in my life that really has triggered uh, this that I cannot see any answer of my dua? If so, correct that mistake, you know, progress, become a better individual on the side of Allah jalla wa ala, and then yes, you will see the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afterwards. Now, we have over here, halal or haram. As I said, um, you're going to find many saying halal, haram, halal, haram. But we have to now look at a few things. When someone says this is halal, that is haram, you've got to understand the severity of the issue. What they're actually saying is, indeed Allah and His Rasul have declared this product, this item, haram or halal. It's a big issue. You're talking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't have the knowledge and you proclaim something haram when it's halal or the opposite, look at the punishment, subhanAllah. Allah says, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُ أَنْسِنَةُكُمْ الْكَذِبِ هَذَا حَلَالٌ وَهَذَا حَرَامٌ لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ لَا يُفْلِحُونَ you not say this is halal and that is haram. Well, you have no knowledge. Well, this indeed is forging a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who forge lies against Allah jalla wa ala would never be successful in this life or the next. Severe punishment, subhanAllah. So if you're in doubt of something, don't go with a gut feeling. I think it's this, I think it's that. You know, subhanAllah, we tend to in our faith become quite lenient. When we're looking at certain matters, certain issues, you just say, I think it's, this is right. I think that's wrong. I, I don't like this. I, don't, I, I favor that instead. And we have to take this very, very lenient approach to our faith, you know, putting things halal and haram as we feel fit. And that's wrong. Definitely. And subhanAllah, the punishment is severe. You will not be successful in this life or in the next. And that's a big issue as well. Not successful in this life. What does that mean? And not successful in the next life as well. What does that mean? Imagine, subhanAllah, not receiving success in the next life. Success in the next life is Jannah, brothers and sisters. So success in this life or in the next Specifically in the next, it is Jannah. So if one is not successful or has been given this promise of Allah Jalla wa ala, that you will not be successful, it's indeed a severe thing. We seek refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. Now in terms of who can issue the hukum or ruling of this being halal or that being haram, that indeed is in the hands of the scholars, the ulama. And we're looking at their guidelines. They've given us certain guidelines and rules that govern what is halal and what is haram. These guidelines, no doubt, they're taken from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of Rasulullah He left us general rules. 
if we look at them and follow them, we can ourselves determine what is halal, what is haram. They might think, what's the big deal? We don't need this, because nowadays you have IslamQA.com, IslamWeb.net. I agree. You simply type up, you can talk to a number of shifts all over the world, asking, asking them their opinion. But let's say, for argument's sake, you don't have that access. You don't have that access to any of these mashayikh, to any website. For any reason, let's say your battery died out, you're there, and you want to buy something to eat, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you have no battery, you don't have the time, and it's costly in terms of making a call. Let's say you're in an airport in a different country, and you don't have that luxury as well. What do you do? If you don't know uh, the guidelines, you may fall into haram. But if you know these guidelines, alhamdulillah, you can make a very educated guess. And you know, most likely in terms of those rules, if you understand them properly, you would be correct in what you've taken, the course that you've taken, inshallah. So we have the first rule over here. And this is a general rule. It states, Al-Aslu bil ashya al shillu wal ibaha General rule. The origin in all things is that they are lawful and legal for consumption. Whatever you see around you, whatever you see in a shop, whatever you see anywhere else, it's all halal. The exceptions, they're very few. So if you understand those exceptions, certain things, pork, for example, and its byproducts, liquor, intoxicants, if we know these exceptions, then we can make a very educated guess. Is it haram, is it halal, based on this rule? So we're not going to ask simply go to the marketplace, well, this is a plastic bottle of I don't know what. Is it halal or haram? It could be haram. We don't say that. We say this over here is halal unless proven to be haram. So we have that guideline, and when we look at it and we use it, it becomes very simple for us to determine if we know the other rules as well. What is halal and what is haram by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So of the haram that we have is in this verse here where Allah Jalla wa'ala says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَ وَالْدَّمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden upon you the carcass of a dead animal. If it dies by itself, out of old age, it's dead, we find it in the street, roadkill for example. Can you eat it? No. That's a mayta. What dam? A dam is the blood. Now, I didn't know who would eat blood, but when I was in uh, the UK, and we were in, I was in the hotel just before coming back to Vancouver, they gave me the continental breakfast, but then there was some blacks, a black disc, oily black disc. I said, what is this? I didn't know. The guy beside me as well as Christians said, what is this? I said, I have no idea. It smells like meat, but I don't know what it is. So we asked, the lady said, this is a blood sausage. So what's a blood sausage? That squabbled pig's blood with some of the uh, leftovers, some meat, uh, parts of the bone. And I was, you know, that, that to me, I almost threw up. But then I'm looking at this family, and they're feeding their newborn baby, not newborn, but one year, two year old baby, and he's sitting there chewing on this, this black disc, enjoying it. Now imagine, subhanAllah, I almost threw up right there and then, because that was disgusting. I could not. I could not bear the sight of watching a kid chewing on a piece of pig's coagulated blood. So here Allah Jalla wa ta'ala forbids it. Whether it's pig's blood, whether it's a cow, a sheep, a chicken. You know, we don't have this kind of thing that we're, we, we, we don't relish in, in drinking a, a, a being's blood, a, a, an animal's blood. Now there are certain cultures that, uh, you know, look at it as being divine almost, where if you drink it, it, it gives you some kind of quality and whatever else, that's all rubbish. It's haram, it's haram, it's filthy. So Allah Jalla wa ala forbids ad-dam, blood. Wa nahmul khinzir, Allah Jalla wa ala also forbids and prohibits consuming pork's flesh. Wa ma uhinda li ghayri Allahi bih. Whatever was sacrificed for other than Allah Jalla wa ala. Let's say you're invited in a, a party, and, uh, or you are in a street party, for example. Uh, as they have over here, the uh, Diwali, and also, what is it called? The Sikh festival, Baisaki. You know, they have it in in Vancouver, uh, it's Main Street, it just gets shut down completely. They give everyone food. You go down to Surrey, likewise, everyone's offering you free food. Now that food, it was prepared, not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but for the sake of other than Allah jalla wa ala. So here, whatever is prepared for other than Allah jalla wa ala, it becomes haram for you as well to consume. So, one mun to an animal that was uh, asphyxiated, when no pulled it, they was struck with a uh, a rock, a bullet, whatever else they died in the of that strike. And then you have a mutaraddi, the one that has fallen from a great height, and naqiha, gorged by other animals. 
Whatever other animals have feasted upon, so there's like a pack of wolves, for example, they're eating from an animal, and then they leave it, you cannot consume it, because it was eaten partly by a group of uh, carnivorous animals. In la madakaytum, except you can eat those, the flesh of these animals, if you have slaughtered it properly, mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon it. So, we'll be discussing these things in some detail, but we do have indication and guidelines clearly marked in the Quran, in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as to what is halal, what is haram. So once again, the rule is, every single thing is halal, except if we have evidence and proof indicating that certain items are exempt, therefore they become haram in that regard. Number two. يَسْأَلُونَكَ مَاذَا أُحِلَّ لَهُمْ قُلْ أُحِلَّ لَكُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ so here, Allah Jalla wa'ala is informing us of a very critical rule. They ask you, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is halal for them? What's halal for us? Allah says to him, O oh Muhammad, tell them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uhilla lakum al-tayyibat. Allah Jalla wa'ala has legalized for you of tayyibat. A tayyibat is the pure, the pure food items as opposed to khabith, which are the filthy food items. How can, how can we determine what is pure and filthy? Once again, by going back to the Quran and the Sunnah. The verse that we've read, it indicates to us what is pure, what is impure. So we have certain uh, issues that we can come across, pigs, flesh, uh, animals that were killed improperly. These would all fall into the category of khabith. But if slaughtered properly and prepared properly, and the flesh being halal unto you to begin with, that will become uh, qayyim. So you have a tayyib and a khabib. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled within us as Muslims a, a system you can say that is quite unique. We can even without realizing or looking at something, we can discern almost instantly whether this is khabib or it's tayyib. Let me share with you a story of what took place in the haram when I was there. And I found it to be very uh, interesting about smoking. To show you how that, that, that internal system that we have, how it works. How Allah Jalla wa has given us that uh, insight as to what is khabith, what is tayyib. So the shaykh was discussing why smoking was haram. And a person was not convinced. He was asking further and trying to make an argument why it's halal or makruh only, not haram. The shaykh said, okay, listen, forget all of the evidences and proofs you're trying to bring to light right now. Let me ask you one single question. We know Allah Jalla wa has legalized for this ummah al tayyibat, the, the pure items. And he has forbidden al khabaib the filthy items. You agree? The man said, yes, I do. OK, now let's ask you this. He said, if you are in the rawda, that's the, the, the part of the masjid that was uh, occupied by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the old part of the masjid in Medina, which is still, you can see it clearly, marked with the different carpets and the pillars. He said, if you are in a rawda, and the time of breaking fast is upon you, would you eat a date in a rawda to break your fast or not? I said, of course I would. Why would you? Because you know within your own self, a date, this fruit is tayyib, not khabith. He said then, how about this? Would you smoke a cigarette in the rawda? He said, a'udhu billah, I would never do that. Why? Because you know it's khabith. So that internal system of you know, marking and discerning between what is tayyib and khabith is given to us. Of course, you know, it has to be guided with you know, the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there are certain indicators that would tell us that certain thing is khabith. For example, with the cigarettes, the smell, the damage it does to one's teeth and his body, and his, which you can see visibly, this would indicate that it is khabith, for it has a negative effect upon the body. So any food item that does have a negative effect upon the body, it will be or categorized as khabith. You avoid it. Even if it's eaten by the masses, you avoid it. And you have many examples in terms of this, whether it's in plant items, uh, in, in uh, meats, also in terms of fish and else and other things as well, where we can classify certain things as being khabi or tayyib, on account of the effect, on account of what was visible from uh, one or eating from that uh, meat or that food item. The third governing principle and rule 
لا ضرر ولا ضرار. Do not harm yourselves or others. This was given by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and his words, no doubt, they are uh, as it's mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given jawami al kadim, meaning Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given the conciseness of speech. He would say a few words, but they would have a vast meaning, an amazing meaning. So subhanallah, he said لا ضرر ولا ضرار. This is one of one of the foremost. Uh, rules and guidelines and principles that we have in the Sharia. One, you know, how many words is that? One, two, three, four, five words. Five words. From these five words, we can derive close to a thousand rulings, if not more, in various aspects of fiqh. It's simply astounding and amazing. They will not go into detail talking about this rule. There are the other rules as well. From this rule, as uh, the words of Rasulullah sallallahu So, in short, without going into too much too much detail, if an item, uh, an ingredient, a food item, it's proven scientifically to be harmful for your body, cancer causing, for example, or it has other repercussions on your nervous system, on you know uh, uh, nerve endings or whatever else, if it's been ascertained and affirmed scientifically, medically. That it is harmful, we say, la dar wa la dirar. It becomes khabib, you don't touch it, you don't go near it, you leave it aside, no matter who does it, no matter who enjoys it, you put it aside altogether. You know, there are uh, products that were in the 60s and the 70s and the early 80s as well that contain certain um, ingredients that were very common. But subhanAllah, as time progressed and the research caught up, it was realized that there are cancer causing ingredients. So immediately they pulled away from those items and those ingredients. Why? Because they cause cancer. So once we realize and know that something does cause cancer or it's harmful for your body, we say, la dar wa la dirar, it becomes haram. It becomes khabib. You should avoid it. No matter how tasty, how delicious, how good looking it is, you put it aside. <clears throat> At times, someone would say, well, the yeah, there is goodness and badness in this. You know, there's a good side and a bad side to it. The, the, the cancer-causing agent is just so minute, so small in terms of its ratio to what's good in the product. So what do we do then? We say still, avoid it. Because we have a rule which we'll cover, I think, very soon. When haram, a harmful thing, and a beneficial thing coexist within one product, we always give priority to the, to the harmful substance and avoid that substance altogether. So if there's any portion of the harm within a product, we say forget it. Leave it aside because Rasulullah said, لا ضرر ولا ضرار. And here it would have a negative impact even over time. You know, in those cancer causing products, it was never the case that a person take one or two or 10 or 20 items, it would give you cancer. It's a matter of life. Over a period of what, 20, 30 years, a person suddenly has cancer. From where? From all that you've taken over the, uh, over the course of 20, 30 years. So a small item, a small amount would you know, become greater and greater and greater and cause that uh, harm to the body afterwards. Ms. The fourth rule, and this pertains to the khamar or alcohol. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu. And here, Ibn Mas'ud said, Whenever you hear the words, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, listen to it very carefully. For indeed, after it is only something beneficial to you that you can put into practice. You will benefit from it. Something you can ponder over. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, Innama al khamru wal maysiru wal ansab wal azlam, rijisun min amal al shaytan, fajay thalibuhu la'allakum tuflihun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, avoid, or you who believe, avoid items of which khamar, which is the alcohol, liquor, spirits, intoxicants. Al-khamar, innam al-khamar. Indeed, the khamar, the intoxicants, liquor, spirits, whatever you want to call it, this is rijz, filth. From the work of shaytan, stay away from it. Fajtanibu. Now the important, the important point over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look at the words, min amal shaytan this alcohol, um, the, the uh, liquor, 
This is from the work of Shaytan. Min amal al-Shaytan. Then directly afterwards, we have the command of Allah Jalla wa'ala, Fajtanibu. We'll be covering this tomorrow in the course, for those of you who will be attending. When you look at a command in the Quran and Sunnah, it indicates an action. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fajtanibu. He's commanding you, he's ordering you, meaning it is wajib for you to avoid every drop of this alcohol. Why? Because it's from the work of shaitan and it has no benefit in it. So that you will become successful in this life and in the next. SubhanAllah. So the khamr, now once again, we put it loosely as alcohol. Now, it is, it's wrong for a person to say, and I've heard this more than once, where a brother was giving a fatwa, and he was talking, or actually not giving a fatwa, but narrating or relating a fatwa. Uh, the shaykh had said that every type of alcohol is haram, it's filthy, it is nudges, it is this, it is that. You gotta be careful and cautious. When we, work, when we use words to describe certain ahkam and rulings, we've got to be very choosy and pick the proper set of words. So here, al-khamr, what does it actually indicate and refer to? Is it, only, is it only liquor, drinkable substances? No. The word khamr, it indicates a few things. First off, it means something that clouds the mind and impairs your judgment. So al-khamr here, ma khamr al-aql, what clouds the mind, impairs your judgment. Whether it's uh, you know, taken orally, you're drinking it up, whether you're injecting it, whether you're sniffing it, whether you're smoking it, whether you put it on topically on the skin and it causes you the same effect, all of this would be khamr. So what is it then? Khamr bin amal is shaytan, the work of shaytan, fajtanibu, avoid it, stay away from it, don't go near it, if you want to be successful in this life or the next. So um, that is the alcohol that's prohibited. So when we look at the word alcohol, we know there are a number of um, chemical alcohols. Methanol, we have, uh, these are the two common types, ethanol and methanol. Now when we're looking at which types are haram, which are halal, we've got to go back and ask ourselves, which types of, it, uh, of alcohol would actually cloud the mind and impair one's judgment? What is it? Ethanol. That would impair your mind your judgment and cloud your mind. So in that sense, this will be he will become the haram category or type. Whereas methanol, you can't say it's haram because it does not do either of the two. It does something far worse. It kills you and makes you blind. And wallah, I'll look to a story. I've said this maybe 20 times already. Those of you who were attending any of our programs in the past, you would have heard this story. But for the sake of repeating it, I'll give it to you. There were a few brothers, may Allah guide them in, in Saudi who were, you know, uh, back then they weren't coming to Canada or anywhere else. So what happened, they were watching movies and whatever else, and they wanted to get drunk. Now, you can't get liquor over there from the superstore. You can't, you can't get nothing like that. At best, you get, uh, you know, you have Barbican and uh, Moosey and uh, the other types of drinks that you can get, non-alcoholic stuff. So if you take 20 of them, something will nothing to you to begin with. You're not going to get drunk. So what they did was, they said, okay, let's go to get something stronger. They went to Abu Riyadi, which is like a, a dollar shop. And they looked into the items and they said, oh, ta ta ta. The, the, here the uh, perfume has alcohol in it. The cheap alcohol is not ethanol. I mean, the cheap perfumes, they don't use ethanol. Because that's an expensive type of perfume that they use now. This over here is a, is a very powerful, potent mix of methanol with a little, a little amount of ethanol. So that would then give you what we call denatured alcohol which is very poisonous. They say a teaspoon of this alone would make you blind. And if you drink the whole bottle, it'll kill you. Anyways, they went out, and they broke the tops of the bottles. Bottoms up, yalla, I climb, bismillah, bottoms up. <laughs> and they all dropped dead. They all dropped dead. So there are certain categories and types of alcohol, looking at what effect they have upon the body. Where if you want to give a hukum or ruling, and this is upon you, brothers and sisters, you can easily do this. I did this research myself. I'm not going to share my results with you. I want you to go ahead and do it yourself. If you go and type in Wikipedia, all types of alcohol, chemical alcohol, type that in. And then just when you have a free time, write down a list. The first side, types of alcohol. The second side, the effect upon the body. It's written there. And then the hukum that you will give to it. So if it says it impairs one's judgment, makes one drunk, puts them into a state of a stupor, 
At that point, you know it's haram. If you look at ethanol, that's the result of ethanol. Look at ethanol, it kills you. Other types, the worst e effect that they would have uh, is, would be like the, a, 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 case of the, a bad case of the runs. That's it. But that's upon you, brothers and sisters. I don't want to share my findings with you, but rather you do the legwork yourself in terms of this. Make a chart, search for the various types of alcohol, give it a hukum from your own end. The reason I'm saying do this because when you do it, you feel really, you feel that, you know, it's just really a gratifying experience. You know, working on a project that will benefit yourself and all those around you, believe it, that you'll, you're going to see the, the, the fruits of this research firsthand because you go to the, uh, to the uh, pharmacy to pick up a certain medicine, you turn the label to see the ingredients and you'll find different types of alcohol. What's the from here? Search for it yourself. Look into it. If you have done that research with the over 10 types of alcohol, you can easily identify if it's haram or haram. So that's a, a homework you guys can do, inshallah. And trust me, it's a very interesting one, too. Can we cover this point over here? And these are just the guidelines. You can read them yourself right now, inshallah. This concept over here, where the alcohol is found. Now we said that there are different types of alcohol, and uh, you know you'll find it in cough syrups, cough drops. You're gonna find it in. There's one actually very strong cough. Uh, uh, it's like a uh, uh, what is it? Uh, I forget the name of the medicine, but it's a very strong one. It kind of just really uh, uh, soothes your throat. I think it's like a buckwheat or something. But look into them. You'll find. Look at the ingredients. You'll be shocked as to what's in there. Um, there's a reason why they say never take the entire bottle at once. I mean, the cough syrup. Never take it all at once because it, it may cure you, but in the end, it's going to give you a buzz, a very strong buzz. Um, so and look at the ingredients, you'll find it. And uh, even up in our pantries, in our kitchens, I mean, you're going to find many items that have alcohol as well. I, after I gave a talk, I mean, it was uh, three years ago or four years ago, I began this topic for searching into different items of the foods and whatnot. You know, I came across pure vanilla extract. And this is something that my mom would always use for various types of cookings and pastries and sweets. So I just I gave the talk and it just came to my mind because someone had mentioned in the crowd, well, this is in all the Indian food, pastries, right? So I said, you know what, I mean, let's go check my mom's pantry. So I go back home, be my mom. My mind is said one thing. I have to open that cupboard door and see what's inside my mom's cupboard. I go home, I open the, the door, and sure enough, I find pure vanilla extract, turn the label, it has a big dose of alcohol, ethanol, in it. So there you have it. You, have, you, you would find alcohol in your own homes, in the privacy of your own homes, pantries, in the kitchen, in many uh, uh, cooking items that you find. It's used commonly. You don't think of them twice. Go back home and check. What do you have in your home that has alcohol in it? And when you see it, you'll be amazed because Rasulullah Wasallam mentioned to us, a time would come when alcohol would become very common and widespread. You might think, okay, the drinking of alcohol become widespread. Okay, that makes sense. But look beyond the drinking part. Look to the, the terms of the hadith, the wording of the hadith literally. It becomes widespread and common in every home. Yes, it has become that way. Pure vanilla extract is in every single home, more or less. It's used in so many applications. You've got powdered forms of ethanol as well that's used in different or various baking products. You have as well in your own washroom, I am sure you're going to find items of alcohol as well. You'll find, for example, mouthwash. I mean, many, many use mouthwash. Uh, you know, there's two types. You have the alcohol-free, and then you've got the ones that have that really strong, uh, you know, when you put it in your mouth and you gargle with it, it, it really bothers. It's like a, a painful experience, more or less. Those ones have alcohol in them. And I didn't know what type of alcohol was there before, you know, but then when I was in a superstore, you know, they had caught a person who had dragged down a bottle of mouthwash. A homeless guy, I think he wanted to get uh, a buzz from, he couldn't get no beer or any alcohol, so he said, might as well, mouthwash. He opens the bottle and drags the whole thing down. And the guy was drunk, but the problem was, you can smell the guy is in a sweat, this is like mouthwash, it's disgusting. So in any case, he was there, and he dragged the stuff down. They drink it because they know it has a degree of ethanol in it. So you have to be careful and watchful, look in your homes. And I'm sure that you will find so many items with ethanol in them. 
And you've got to be careful. You're going to find the new hand creams, hand sanitizers as well. Those of you who have hand sanitizers right now, open it right now and check. Look at the label. What's written inside there? You'll see it's written ethyl alcohol, ethanol basically. That's haram. It's impure. It's filthy. So you're going to find so many items, you know, whether it's in your own bedroom, in your own washroom, in the kitchen, in your car even, you're going to find alcohol in various products that we use, subhanAllah. Uh, to make it a bit more interesting, actually, I have over here a little finding that I came across. You heard in that video, uh, it was mentioned in the death of the brothers. Uh, I, w I was crazy over ice cap, um, ice mocha, ice teas. Uh, I was crazy over the Boston cream, Canadian maple. I love that stuff. I would always eat that. It was my only daughter that I would ever eat are those ones with those drinks. So then, I, in the beginning, there was a research done by some researchers, medical researchers. So I took the word for granted because they had gone back to the uh, Tim Hortons uh, company and they asked through a medical research that we need to know which of your products contain, donuts that is, which of them contain alcohol. At first they did not want to tell, but once, once they realized it's a medical research, they gave them, them the information. They, they had mentioned that any donut with a filling has alcohol in it. So that means Boston creams, Canadian maples, strawberry filled, all that stuff, it's off the window. Don't touch it. There's alcohol in it. And the reason they put alcohol is because it saves on the uh, cost of sugar. Because if you just put sugar upon sugar, that gets costly. But then if you put alcohol, uh, you put one, 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 uh, you know, one serving of sugar with one serving of alcohol, that makes it very sweet, as opposed to having three servings of, of sugar. So they use it just to kind of increase the, the flavor value of, uh, and the price to make it better for themselves. They can get a more better or, you know, uh, return for their investments, what I say. Now, I thought that, well, that was all. So I handed that I'll quit this stuff and I'll exchange them for something else. Then I went to Toronto, and the brothers there, mashallah, did further research into ice caps. And, and I was, the problem was, it was so hot, I was in, the, in Toronto and keep teaching the fifth of prayer in a gother course, and then the brother brought me, Allah hit a huge ice cap on the table. And I'm like, mashallah, and I drink this. And the brother runs down, he said, brother, here's a paper we bought from the Tim Horton Hotel. <laughs> and sure enough, it contains alcohol, ethanol as well. So I'm like, yeah, you can take, I can't drink this. There's like a lot in the trash, basically. That's it. A lot of stand. So it has alcohol. They, they call it trace amounts of alcohol within uh, the flavored products. So almost everything does have alcohol. Wherever you go, and you're going to find it all over the place. It may seem that life becomes impossible, but indeed, if you are trying your best to live your life, in accordance to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi there's always a way. Whoever fears Allah Jalla wa ala and makes it his priority, Allah Jalla wa ala will give him an easy way out of his problems. And Allah Jalla wa ala would bless him from where he least expects. SubhanAllah. Um, so here, I mean, you're going to find it all over the place. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, are you going to talk more about applying alcohol topically for medical? Yeah, we're going to come to that, inshallah. Okay. The fifth rule. Let's only get to the rules first. We can come to the. We can talk about each of the examples afterwards. The fifth rule. Now, uh, this goes to an issue called jalal. It says over here, "Nahan al Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam an al Himam al Ahli." Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade the Sahaba to eat the flesh of a domesticated donkey. We just call it a donkey. Uh, you have the wild donkeys, zebras. That's halal to eat. And then you have the domesticated donkeys, which are the donkeys that you would see in, you know, what, in Shrek, that kind of a donkey, <laughs> that is how long to eat. You cannot eat that thing. Now, there's a reason, of course. There's a big reason for this. Now, I'm going to ask you right now, I'm going to ask you now, you know the reason why it's how long to eat uh, Shrek's best friend? <laughs> anyone? Let's see, anyone? Why is it how long to eat a donkey? What does it eat? What is the food of a donkey? Does it graze on grass? Come on, you gotta see. I mean, didn't you watch any nature shows and whatnot? You gotta see them. Well, and they're in the cities, right? In, in the third world countries, South America, they're roaming in the streets. They're, they're eating from garbage dumps, right? A donkey is like a pig in the sense that it eats the worst of, uh, of food. It eats the trash, the rubbish, the, the garbage. That's what it eats. So its entire food, all of its food, is filled in rubbish and trash and garbage. So the flesh of that animal is more or less tainted with the filth of what it has eaten. This is what we call al-jallada. 
So any animal that the majority of its feed comes from filth, it becomes haram for you to consume. And the prohibition is so severe in terms of eating this, it's shocking. One day, Rasulullah came across a sahabi who was cooking meat. And it was a time of famine, no one had meat. So Rasulullah was somewhat, you know, uh, intrigued. How did you get that meat? He said, that sahabi said, Rasulullah, this meat is from our donkey. We killed the donkey and we, this is the flesh of that donkey. Rasulullah said, right now, dump out the contents of your bowls, smash the utensils as well. So they had pots that they cooked the food in, break those pots, empty the contents of those food on the ground in the dump, don't touch it, don't eat it. Why? Because it's jannah. The majority of its food comes from filth. No doubt a person will be affected by what he consumes. If a person consumes from these filthy animals, he too would be somewhat affected, whether directly or indirectly, over a period of time, by what he has consumed, whether it's in terms of health or ethical behavior. So this is how. Now, it's only for donkeys, brothers and sisters. Let's say, now to make this a bit interesting, let's say that there's a cow or a sheep that's been fed chemicals, hormones, or a chicken that was fed its entire life hormones and growth hormones and all of these chemical byproducts so that it pops up within a matter of a week to a full grown animal. Its food now is not natural, it's been fed filth harmful items, and it becomes jallada in that sense. How long are we to consume? So all our meats? Here? Hold on a second, shut up. <laughs> Not just that, the milk of a jallada becomes how long are we to consume too? So you have the meats, the flesh, haram, then you have the, the milk as well, haram. Now I'm not saying to you, uh, everything we're eating over here and drinking is haram. I can't make that judgment call. I've not done that research, nor do, nor do I want to do that research to begin with. When you go down to the different factories and uh, farms to see what the animals have been fed, more or less right now, if no one has done that research, you can go ahead and assume everything is haram and must prove it to be haram. Right? But once that research is done and completed, and it should be done or completed for us to have a better idea and understanding, because you know, there are certain farms that use a chemical approach, and there are others that don't use that chemical approach. You'll even, you can even taste the difference in terms of the milk, as you know, a fresh farm animal, dairy cow, and as to one that's been fed chemicals for its entire life. I mean, so it's a resource that can be done, inshallah. I don't have the time myself, or the, uh, the even the energy to do this to, to begin with, but if you do have it yourselves, you can divide yourselves into groups and search into it. Does that have power to you to do that? You can share, share with us your findings with the night time. It's a serious issue. If we know, let's say for sure, that a certain animal was fed filth for its entire life, it becomes jalala, you cannot consume it, you cannot drink of its uh, milk. If we're unsure, then in that case you don't assume anything unless we've proven that doubt with sure knowledge. We covered this point over here with jalala. The sixth. They're saying whatever is revolting. It's not a, it's not a general rule, but it's what we say in Kamaliyat, where it's a rule that it kind of fills up uh, to, because we're, we're supposed to live our lives ethically in the best ethical manner. So one of the ethical manners that we should uphold is not, we should not to eat something that is revolting. Now, the issue of something being revolting and not is a very, uh, it's subject to different uh, cultures and views. If you go to Saudi, for example, and you eat, if you see what they eat, you might find it revolting. You know, they would eat desert lizards and whatever else, and grasshoppers. You might think, well, this is disgusting, how can you eat that? But it's nothing wrong with them, they eat that stuff. But now you would eat something that they would find likewise revolting in that sense too. So unless there's a proof that something is revolting, then it's best that you avoid it. And this is based upon what happened during Rasulullah's time when he was offered a desert lizard. Now, if you've not seen these animals, they're impressive reptiles, big. And the interesting thing is, if you cook it even, it's because they're cold-blooded. If they're killed immediately and then cooked, they may even still move while they're cooked or after they're cooked. So you put it up with the rice, and its leg will still move, or its arm will still move, or the tail will be turning left and right on top of the rice. And they go ahead and eat it, not a problem. They eat this whole thing. So um, 
This was given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he looked at this and he could not eat it. He could not. But Khan ibn Walid radiallahu anhu began eating this thing and joined it too. And then he suddenly stopped. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you're not eating. Take part. He said, no, no, I can't eat this. He said, Ya Rasulullah, is it because it's haram? He said, no, it's not haram, but I can't eat this because it's not in the land of my people. You can eat it yourself. So here, if a person finds something revolting, he's not to force himself to eat something that he cannot, you know, does not feel comfortable with. You know, you have people who are comfortable, for example, with, um, people who are comfortable with uh, uh, desert lizards, with locusts, with hyenas. If you want to eat that stuff, it's up to you. If that's your thing, eat it, alhamdulillah. But not everyone likes it. I mean, there are certain things you would not like. You go to different cultures as well. You find them eating rotten fish. Um, I mean, even cheese filled with worms. Uh, it doesn't taste that bad. It tastes okay. I'm proud of myself. But then, it's okay. It's not bad. It's, yeah, you don't like it, but I like it. It's not a problem, child. But in any case, I mean, it depends on what you like. So just because you, you, you're un, you're not familiar with something, you don't want to eat that thing. Don't force yourself to eat it. So you're not obliged to eat something that's halal just because it's halal. But rather, it's not a choice. You can pick what you want. This seventh rule is an interesting one. We covered it somewhat before. إِذَا اجْتَمَعَ حَاضِرٌ أَوْ بِحُدِّمَ جَانِبِ الْحَضَرَ عَنِ الْإِبَاحَةِ When haram and halal coexist within one item, within one uh, product, we always give priority to the haram over the halal and we avoid touching it, we avoid eating it. Now, just to give you a few practical examples. Let's say you went to a restaurant and you ordered your food, a Mongolian grill, let's say. You, you ordered it just simply vegetarian. Noodles with some vegetables, whatever else. And the guy before you had ordered meat, pork. And they only have one wok, right? So he put his pork on there with the alcohol, and he cooked the thing together, and they gave it to him, and he began scraping away whatever remnants were there, but there's still some pork fat, as well as uh, alcohol, on that grill, but they have not washed it. They take your vegetables, your noodles, and they dump it on top of that as well. And you can be sure here, absolutely sure, that that pork fat is now coated uh, on your salad vegetables and your noodles, you know, because pork fat is a lot of it's kind of weird. Yeah, if you've ever seen it, it's such a sticky, sticky, sticky item. Even when it's cooked, it's like glue as if I would have That's gross. So it sits on top of that grill, you put your vegetables on top of this thing, you cook it together, and you'll find that there are a lot of pork remnants, the fat, and extra bits and pieces here and there, now in your salad. And wallahi, if you eat that salad, you're going to taste a meat taste. Why? Because the person before you had eaten or had cooked pork on it. So here we have halal, it's all vegetables and noodles, but then you have haram in terms of what? That pork, that, that alcohol that was on that grill, and now it's in your plate. So we say it's haram to eat this because you have both halal and haram coexisting within one product. You give priority then to the haram over the halal and toss it aside. And you can get many examples of this. You can go through hundreds of examples. Hundreds of examples uh, in, our, uh, in our restaurants, in our universities, and even in halal restaurants, we find the same thing. You can determine now with this rule, I think 90% of what you see in the marketplace, 90% if not more, with this one rule, you can determine what is halal, what is haram. Now the issue is, uh, is sometimes asked, why do you get priority to the haram over the halal? It goes back to that very first question. Why eat halal to begin with? Because of your du'a. That's, a, that's what it, that's what's at, at stake over here, your du'a. You want your du'a to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't want it to be rejected by Allah jalla wa ala. Therefore, you do your best to ensure the acceptance of that du'a. So you give priority then to the haram over the halal, and if they coexist within one product, salamu alaykum that product, we're not gonna touch it. We will not eat it, we will not consume it. Now here is something I found very interesting. This is, it was being introduced in, in the marketplace, in the superstore and elsewhere, cheese made from a woman's breast milk. And they were actually, it was interesting because they were serving this in a survey. They had put cheese from cow, from I think it was a goat, and then the woman's breast milk. And they asked the participants, ooh, that's a lot of we're lucky to take part in this. They asked them, what do you like the most? And they found an astounding number of people favoring the breast milk over all the milk. Now, let me ask you, well, is this haram or halal? What do you think? If you have an answer, put your hand up and give me the reasons. Not because it's revolting, but let's see other, other reasons beyond that. Yes? Maybe 
maybe the lady like who made it, she drank out of it. What if she drank it all out? Let's say a Muslim sister gave the milk. So a Muslim sister gives her the milk and you, she receives it in her milk, you can eat it and it's halal. If she didn't drink any alcohol. A Muslim sister. <laughs> you eat it then. I would eat it, but anyways, let's see. Anyone else in travel? Yes, sister. Yes. Okay, we have, that's a good point though. You raise a good point. You know, if a, if, a, if a child is breastfed by a woman, the mahramiyya would be affirmed. Basically, she would become a milk mother to this child. But when a child grows up, the issue really is, does it take that effect as well or not? Many of the scholars would say no, but there is a narration, which is known as the as narration of Sadim. In this narration, we see that uh, this full-grown man had difficulty because he was raised as an orphan within the family, and he became practically part of that family. But he was not breastfed, so he was raised up and he grew up, this person is uh, like his mother, like his sister, but then, you know, when he grew up, he could not enter upon them, and he found it very difficult. So at that point, when he was a full-grown man, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked that he be fed of the milk of one of the women, of course, not directly, indirectly, the utensil, and then it was given to that, to that man, he drank the milk, and the mahramiyah was then affirmed for him towards them. So he could not get married to them, nor could they get married to him. So in that regard, we have this one instance within the Sharia that does mention that there is mahramiya there to be established or affirmed between the two parties. That's a, that, this could be a factor, no doubt over here. It could be a factor. Anything else? Any other reason why? So you have one point the brother said about alcohol. Number two about uh, you know it having an effect upon one's mahramiya or relation towards the person. Another one. Come on. Think of it scientifically speaking. Is it that healthy? For a child, yes. yes. But for an adult? From unknown, not one, but unknown multitude of women giving the milk, it's pulled together and mixed, and then from that the cheese is made. That's a problem then. Because there could be gen genetic problems. There could be disease transmitted as well within the milk itself. So all in all, we have a number of reasons that would, we can look at this as being unfavorable or even haram in that regard. And one should avoid it and not take it at all. In the last chapter, we spoke of this in detail. Okay, we have the rule over here, in which Rasulullah said, "Ma askara kathiruhu fa qariluhu haram." This hadith gives us a very important rule: what its great amount intoxicates, a small amount is haram as well. So, we're looking at the uh, the ice cap from Tim Hortons. You know, if you drink 30 or 40 of them, you're not going to get drunk. No one would say that you're going to get drunk, but it does contain trace amounts of alcohol. Trace amounts, that's an alcohol introduced within the drink. So you have this drink, ice and flavor. They put the alcohol there to basically stabilize the flavor, first of all. And then second, to increase the uh, sugar value of that drink, to make it more sweet than it actually is. So the, it's introduced for these reasons. But it's a very small amount. So they call it trace amounts of alcohol. How much exactly? They'll give you a fraction, a ratio, but how accurate is it? Allah because. It's poured by that machine, there could be more, there could be less. Regardless, if we're to take that trace amount, look at the hadith, whatever its great amount intoxicates, its small, minute amount is haram as well. So if we're to, if we're to extract that trace amount from the drink, right, the drink, the ice cap, if we're to extract the trace amount of alcohol from that drink, multiply it by a thousand, and you get a cup full of, of these trace amounts, and you drink it, that will make you drunk. Because it's pure alcohol. Ethanol, more or less. So the trace amount, when multiplied, it will make you drunk. Therefore, its small amount, likewise, will become haram based on this hadith from Rasulullah. So Allah alayhi wa sallam, whatever its great amount intoxicates, its small amount becomes haram as well, no matter how small. We also view alcohol not only as being haram because of this reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it rijs, impure, filthy. He says, Fajtaibu, stay away from it. So these are important factors. Filthy, stay away from it. Now, with alcohol being impure, we believe its impurity rivals, or is greater than the urine, than, and then the human urine. 
it's greater than that. And if we see someone cooking whatever it is, and they're putting a, a you know a tea, tablespoon of urine in that cake to stabilize the taste factor of that cake because it's too sweet to make it a bit neutral, you wouldn't touch it. If it's cooked for three, four, five hours, you would not eat that cake. Why? Because there's, there is urine in that cake. Alcohol, we said it's far more severe in terms of its impurity than uh, urine. Yet, when it's put into a cake, half a bottle or whatever else, people eat it, they enjoy it, they consume it, that's a lot of it. But alhamdulillah, we do have an alternative for the uh, pure vanilla extract. You have what they call the alcohol-free um, natural vanilla extract, which is a bit expensive. You can find it in, uh, in the, uh, some certain grocery stores. I think it's Whole Foods and whatnot. They have it there. You can purchase it from there. And they, it's not too expensive. It's reasonable. So you do have that alternative, alhamdulillah. But the pure vanilla extract, it, it'll tell you, it has alcohol in it, 35.5%. And that's a big amount of solar idea. Like we said, where can you find the pure vanilla extract? These are only a few examples. Any food that's sweet, look into it, you'll find that it does have a certain degree of vanilla extract. Okay, we have now gelatins. Now, let me just quickly run through this topic of gelatin. I don't want to go into too much detail with gelatin. I'm going to give you time for the Q&A. So gelatin over here, we have a few issues with it. The very first one is, how is it made? The second issue, is it transformed from a state to another state? Is it still, is it still uh, in its original state or not? So the very first one, we look at it, where is it taken from? We have uh, gelatin taken from the bones and skin of pig. And likewise, the bones of a cow. Uh, so these are the primary sources of, uh, uh, of the gelatin. Now we put them into vats cooking them at high temperatures, they, they, they put in that mix vinegar, some salt, lemons and limes and other uh, you know, materials and ingredients. It cooks and cooks and cooks till the, that, that bone or that skin breaks down and then you have a very thick froth at the top. That thick froth is taken out of the pot, set to dry and then smashed into powder and then you add the, the flavors, the sugar, the colorings, and that is the gel that we use and that, or that we have in the packages. Now it's always very easy to tell or distinguish between gel from a beef source and that from a pig source. Now as we did a research from the UCLA University, from the, uh, it's from the uh, science department, they said a pig is a pig down to its smallest enzymes. They said it's very simple to distinguish between gelatin from a pig source and beef from, from uh, uh, gelatin from a beef source. You cook, you make the two of them, put them out in the sun, you'll find gelatin made from beef will break down to water within a matter of minutes. Whereas gel, jello made from uh, a pig source, it becomes dark in color, leathery, hard, and it just holds its shape, subhanAllah. So pig is a pig right down to its basic enzymes, that's a lot of it's a filthy animal. So in that regard, looking at it, if we want to say or look at gelatin, whether it's halal or haram, we have to ask ourselves now, is there a chemical transformation in the process of gelatin or not? We're asking this because we know, let's say if you have a pig's carcass, and that pig's carcass is burned to ash, that ash is no longer filthy, it's a new substance altogether, it's ash. And it would now be pure in that sense. If someone buries a pig's carcass at the base of an apple tree, we know after a year or so, ultimately, that there will be certain nutrients derived from the carcass of that pig to the apple. But no one would say that the apple is haram. It's pure because there's a chemical transformation now from the carcass of the pig to the apple, the end result, the fruit. So if there's a chemical transformation, that chemical transformation would render the object haram. If it's a partial transformation, it becomes haram. Let's look at the gelatin now it's made. In a big pot, you put the skin and the bones, boiling them for 12 to 24 hours, whereby the bone, the skin, breaks down into a froth. You can do it in your own home too. Take a pressure cooker, put a piece of bone, boil it and boil it and boil it. You'll see when after 24 hours passes and it's boiling, open the pressure cooker pot, you'll see only a, a thick froth, a thick froth at the top of the pot. That's all that remains, subhanAllah. 
Now, um, is it a complete transformation or only a partial? If it's a complete transformation, you can take any, any item, any uh, type of flesh or bone or skin and put it in that, and the end, is, and, and the end result should be halal. So if we take now a piece of pig meat, a pork chop, and put it in the pot for 24 hours, would you eat that soup or not? You wouldn't because it's pig there. The pig fat and the, the meat is saturated now into strands. You're not going to eat that. You're not going to drink it. Why? Because you know definitely now that that pig is still there. Nothing has changed. At most, it only is a partial transformation, not a complete transformation. And the ulama of the fifth councils of Jeddah and Makkah have issued the fatawa and it is haram to consume gelatin. Now gelatin, it impacts us in a very great way. I mean, it's in almost every single thing we come across. The gelatins, you find them in, um, you find them in, in yogurts, you find them in almost every item. You'll find them in their gelatin, gelatin, gelatin. I mean, I made a point of really going out and looking for halal, um, halal uh, yogurt. It has no gelatin whatsoever. And I did find that there are certain brands, it says no gelatin. I'm right in the front, you can get that line. Kosher brands and whatever else, they don't have gelatin in them to begin with. So it's best that you do, if you want to eat a yogurt, to make sure it does not have gelatin in it. So you would avoid eating a byproduct of the haram, which is the pork, or a beef that's been killed uh, anisamically. It's found as well in medicines, capsules, gel, gel capsules. These are all taken from either pig sources or, uh, or uh, unlawfully slaughtered beef. If there's an alternative, we go to that alternative in terms of the medicines. But if there's no alternative whatsoever, and that medicine is only offered in a gel capsule, we say, in this line, or in this instance, it becomes halal to consume because there's a dire need, a pressing urge, urging need, that requires of you to save yourself, your body, so you can then sort of consume that gel capsule if it's the only resort. Um, these are just a few figures you can read through them, brothers and sisters. You know, this is just, it, it counters the claim that if you cook with alcohol, the alcohol evaporates. But this is a complete uh, hoax. For two and a half hours even, 5% of the alcohol remains. Still a significant amount. And the funniest thing was, and people told me that, if you flame the alcohol in French cookings, all the alcohol is gone. 75% remains. SubhanAllah. It's a big amount. How long is that? This as well, we covered this in the, uh, in the, in the uh, class. We'll move on and child to this point, but you can read this one as well. There's nothing wrong with this, although it sounds odd, it's nothing wrong with it at all. Chocolate liqueur, it contains no alcohol. The name might sound like liquor, haram, but it's not. You have over here rennet. It's halal, that's the end result, although there is a khilaf among the scholars. But since the Sahaba had eaten from the cheese that were prepared by the uh, Magians, the fire worshippers, we can say Rasulullah would have informed the Ummah that if it was haram, he would have told them it's haram. So he did not inform them that it was haram. So when he kept silent, that means it's haram to eat cheese, whether from any source. I mean, not pig, but from a beef and vegetarian source. And monoglycerides, deglycerides, triglycerides. Likewise, if you see them, I've seen even people going as far as saying that there's halal bread, haram bread. But monoglycerides now, they're broken down to a chemical level. A chemical level where it cannot be turned back to its original state. Yes, the source could be a pig, it could be a beef, a cow, it could be anything else, but if it's been broken down to its chemical level, then it becomes halal for consumption, no doubt. Monoglycerides, triglycerides, all of them would be the same. They create the same hukum and ruling. Nutmeg, this is a chakra as well. This is haram. The reason is that it causes an effect like marijuana, or even worse. And look at the side effects, that's a lot of, of overdosing on uh, nutmeg. Nausea, vomiting, insomnia, dry mouth, constipation, heart palpitations, hallucinations, spasms, fever, shock, imp uh, impending doom, 
psychotic episodes, death has even occurred in this as well. That's all I'm adding. So whatever it's small amount or big amount it causes this harm, the small amount becomes haram too. Ma asbara kafiru faqarinu haram. So this will be haram as well. Now, let's look at this brothers. These are four, four items. Now we've covered the rules. Let's test your knowledge in terms of these things over here. The very first one, can someone tell us what is pepsin? Anyone? You know what that is? Yes. It's an, it's an enzyme found in the stomachs of uh, animals. Which animal? Uh, pepsin breaks down protein. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Anyone? It says, right, it's an enzyme in the stomachs of an animal. Which one? I want to say cow. Pigs. Okay. So you find pepsin, right? In the lining of a pig. And you'll be shocked. This is used in high class cheese. If you like cheeses, once again, I mean, you have many types of delicious cheeses over here. All these things, it's called Oka cheese and whatever else. If you like those types of cheeses and those, those items, you'll find that they do contain a certain degree and level of pepsin. It's a coating to give it that extra bit of taste and flavor. So it is from the lining of a pig. You see now in the ingredient, what do you say now? It says a very slight amount, a small amount of pepsin added to a great amount of halal made from milk. What's the rule in here? If you have an answer, raise up your hand. What's the rule now? You have pepsin on coated cheese. I mean, it's a very slight layer of pepsin, and you've got the cheese, the bulk of that part, cheese, milk, that's it. But there's a very slight layer of pepsin there. Haram or halal? Okay, that is good. Um, so here you have a slight amount of pork, or pork product, or pork seam product, therefore it becomes haram. That's good. How about lard? We find it in almost every product. You find it in cookies and uh, shortenings and why not? Is it halal or haram? Why is it haram? Is it haram? Why? Give me a rule that we covered before. Anyone? Who wants to tackle the, the uh, lard? Yes. Okay, so if the lard is taken from a pig, it's haram. All right. How about from a beef? From a cow? You got the beef, the tallow, and whatever else, uh, beef shortenings. Halal or haram? Halal? Who said halal? Why is it halal? True. But here we have the uh, beef slaughtered by non Muslims. No, that's what we're talking about. You have the products in the marketplace right now. It says beef shortening. You know, definitely, it's a company, it's a Christian company or a non Muslim company. If you're living in a Muslim country, yeah, no doubt, we're not going to question these issues. But we're not going to even raise them because halal, halal. But living here in the West, we have to ask these questions. The beef shortening, no doubt, definitely is taken from non halal sources. An animal is killed, electrocuted to death, captive bolt system, or some other method, it was killed in that fashion. And then the bones and the marrow are taken, and then you have this lard product or the beef shortening product made from that haram or that unlawfully killed, sacrificed animal. So we say it's inappropriate because of the fact that it's been killed inappropriately. Number three, saccharin. And you know what saccharin is? It's a sweetener, right? But lately it's been proven to cause cancer. So what guideline would this fall under? Which rule? Rasulullah said what? La barra la barra. Not harm yourself or others. Since there's a harm now in terms of your own health, cancer causing item. Put it aside, no matter where you find it, it's sacred, it's haram, because of that reason. You have olestra. You know what this is, olestra? Yes, is it, is it halal or haram? Why is it halal? Okay. That's, okay. Okay. Okay, what are the side effects of taking this in, in a, a large amount? Okay. What else? Well, okay, so, so in that case, yes, we look at the side effects, after effects, and study what it is to begin with. At that point, we can then make a conclusion, halal or haram. So this is in that in this regard, yes, correct. Alhamdulillah. So, I mean, you can go across many items, many ingredients individually, and you'll come across with these guidelines, you'll be able to come to a conclusion within the data on your own. Uh, with this, we come to the conclusion of the seminar today. Yes, go ahead. Uh, can you please uh, elaborate more on the saturated parts? Because um, if you look at milk, there's lactose in there, which is a polysaturated as well. 
Uh, oh, you mean saccharin? Sorry. You mean the number three? The number three? Yeah. No, saccharin is like a, it's a sweetener, like nitro sweet. Oh, it has nothing. No, 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 no it's different. It's nitro sweet is like it's in the past they're using it in gums and different items like a sweetener, but it, it was it caused cancer in lab uh, lab mice. <coughs> so they they said okay, they discontinued it altogether to use other types of uh, uh, of chemicals to take its place. Yes, is that enough? Yes. Um, I have a question in regards to. Well, looking at the bacteria, you have to understand first of all what's the side effect upon the body. If there is a side effect upon the body, then we can use that as a guide, whether it's haram or halal. This rule that we covered, not haram or halal, not harm yourself or others. That would require me to go back to our research to see and ask what's the effect upon the, the body? Is there any effect upon the body? If so, we then base a herbal rule on that. So you can take each of the individual cases based on the rules that would cover. Yes. So considering what you said, not peeling the, the apple over there is haram. What is it? Not peeling the, the skin of the apple is haram. Why? Because of so many, uh, so many chemicals on the skin. We know yes. that the chemicals concentrate on the skin. So yes. It's a good question. Is anybody called? You know, the apples over here, they're coated with chemicals. They're unless they're, unless they're organic, of course. So you have the normal apple is non-organic, um, chemically uh, sprayed. The, the skin, yes, it will have a chemical, but if you wash it off, clean it off, that'd be okay. So it's just a matter of you know, purifying. If you can be purified, you can purify it. But at certain times when the chemical is within the, what do you call it, the item, saccharin, for example, within gum, within a certain product, we avoid it because now we know it's a cancer-causing agent. But here, if it's washed off, it would not be that case. It would be different. Yes. Is that, yes. Uh, about the beef, it's good for non Muslims. It's yes. not halal. So basically, we can never eat it at all. No, we have an exception. It's Ahlul Kitab. We can't. Ahlul Kitab are the Christians and the Jews. Yeah, they slaughter. I'm not talking about the Christians. No, I'm not talking about Christians. I'm talking about Christians as well. The Christian slaughters it, a Jew slaughters it in general. And they slaughter it in accordance to what we have in our Sharia, hand slaughtering it properly, then we can eat it, no problem, alhamdulillah. But if it's, as it is today, in the vast majority of the West, talking about over 95%, where it's, you know, it's prepared in slaughter home houses, uh, it's more or less a mechanical procedure, where the animal is put through a system, a captive bolt system, where its brain is blasted within its own head, it goes in, it becomes unconscious, and then they drag it up and they cut it down, Many a time it would die in that state. So yes, if it's killed in that fashion, it becomes halal for you to consume. Outright halal. The only time it becomes halal, if a Muslim slaughters it, a Jew or a Christian. As long as it's within the guidelines of our Sharia.